everybody hear me? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for showing up this early, this morning. Uh, this is my first time here in, in Ukraine, my first time in Kyiv. I'm having a great time. Uh, so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I really hope you are enjoying this conference as much as I'm doing it. Uh, yesterday was a fantastic day, and I tried to make it as good uh, as that today. Um, so just a second about me. My name, again, is Lucas Bernardi. I work as a principal data scientist in Booking.com. Uh, my main responsibility is machine learning, uh, mainly about production editing, machine learning models, making sure we can put them in production in front of our customers. I also work quite a bit on recommender systems and personalization, and just a little bit on experimentation uh, to make sure we, we deploy the right things to, for our users. Um, a little bit about Booking.com. We have about 28 million uh, available properties to book right away with immediate uh, confirmation in our website. About six millions of them are actually homes and apartments and all these weird places where you can stay. Like uh, in Japan, we have these tubes where you can go and stay in the tube, and all you get is actually the tube itself. And you sleep there, you, you eat there, and you know more stuff. It's super weird, actually. But you can you can book it in Booking.com, and we have availability in about uh, 150,000 destinations, and we make uh, about 1.5 uh, million transactions every day. Now, I'm not telling these numbers just to impress you. I hope they do impress you, by the way. But, but uh, the reason why I tell you these numbers is mainly to justify how we get terabytes of data every day. And what do we do with these terabytes of data? We throw machine learning at it. It's the coolest thing you can do this, these days with data, right? Um, and that, that means we managed to deploy about uh, 200 models. Actually, I was checking yesterday. It's exactly 371 models running live today. And I wanted to, to discuss a little bit how, how, we, how we get there. Uh, but what do we do with machine learning in, in Booking.com, first of all, right? And here's a screenshot of uh, our search results page. It's a pretty old one, actually, but uh, you know, most of the gadgets you see around are still available on the website. And I said, how about I black out, I just remove all the components where we use some machine learning? And then you get something like this. And it's uh, not very compelling because we're using machine learning everywhere and you can't see anything, right? So I decided to actually highlight the components where you can actually see where we're using machine learning. And you can see we are doing pretty much everything you can imagine about machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, metric learning, which is not so popular problem, but we use it. Um, recommendation system, of course, personalization, uh, you name it. And this is just the website. This is just one page of the website. Machine learning, we use it all across the organization for customer service, for back-end system where we recommend hoteliers and owners of properties how to optimize their own business. We actually use uh, marketing. Uh, uh, even human resources, how we optimize where is the best place to invest, for example, in a new development center. We use machine learning everywhere we can. Um, and if you want to run 100 machine learning, machine learning models live, the first thing you need is to need them. You need to need the machine learning models, otherwise there's no point, right? So how do we make sure that we actually need hundreds of machine learning models? Uh, how do we make sure that, that they make sense from a commercial point of view? So in order to, to understand that, I would like to introduce uh, a process, an organizational process that we run in our, our company, and we call it the continuous learning uh, process. And this process is used across the organization in all different departments to make sure we, we, we continuously learn about our customers, about our users, and we improve our business um, accordingly. And this consists of a pretty simple workflow of uh, six or seven steps. And the first one is the team product gets uh, an idea. And this idea might come the, from anywhere. It could be uh, the result of a brainstorming session from the product team. It could be uh, something they read in, a, in an article in the internet. It could be, I don't know, some user research that we saw in some country that someone is doing something wrong and we get the idea to improve it. Or it could be a shower idea. You know, you wake up, take a shower, and you have an amazing idea that will change the book in the comp forever, and you go to your team and, and you know, present this idea to them. Or it can be something we steal from the competition. Why not? And essentially what we do with this idea, doesn't, come, doesn't matter where it comes from, um, we turn it into what we call hypothesis. And this hypothesis is quite formal object. It's not mathematical, but we call it a colloquial hypothesis. And it states uh, the idea in a way that we can actually test it. And then the data science comes in. And we call it a scientist, and, and the data scientist helps the product team to design an experiment uh, that uh, helps us to understand whether the hypothesis is correct or wrong. So we design the treatment and the hypothesis. We do power calculations. If there are statisticians in the rooms, you know what I mean. 
Um, other writers look at it as, as, as a way to introduce a change in the website or in the system, whatever it is, in such a way they can learn from it. And sometimes, only sometimes, um, the experiment requires a machine learning model. And then we build the model, and once we have the experiment design, we have the model, we have the hypothesis, we are able to actually run the experiment. Usually it takes three or four weeks, and after that time, we look at the results, and we make an interpretation, we learn from it, and we repeat this process again, and usually we get ideas about whether the hypothesis was correct or wrong, and then we can, we can keep on iterating, and you can imagine how this continuously improves our systems and, of course, our understanding of, of the business. So I understand this might be a bit abstract, so let me show you an example, a concrete example of how we run this process. So the first idea, remember the first step is to get an idea. The idea came from an insight from the, our data uh, that we collect from our users. And it's a bit of a problem because it says that about 30% of the searches um, of people that self-report themselves as uh, traveling with kids, the searches don't have information about their kids. So something, something is going wrong, because if you're traveling with kids, you should enter the information about your kids as soon as possible so we can give you better information. But for some reason, 30% of these searches don't have any information about their kids. And this is quite painful, because in many situations, uh, that means the recommendations they get are completely irrelevant, and it can be quite inefficient. So this is the idea, and what's wrong here? It could be a bug, right? It could be maybe that, that the, the website doesn't work well. It could be our database is not registering the information about the kids. It could be that we're actually, everything is fine, but we're just pushing away people from giving us information about their kids. Um, it can be many things, right? But the hypothesis that the product team came up with is the idea that the families simply forget about their kids. And if you get this reference, uh, that tells you something about my age, and also about yours. Um, so that's the hypothesis, and you can see it's quite concrete, quite, quite, quite testable. It's simply uh, people traveling with kids forget about their kids. And, they, and this is quite painful. We see cases where, a lot of cases where they go all the way to book a hotel, and they're very happy, you know, you're going to Crete Island, it's amazing, you book, this amazing place, and you know, let's book it, yes, it's, it's okay, the, the money, book, whatever, oh, and they forgot about Kevin. So now they need to cancel the reservation, and start the whole process over, and that's usually a pain and we want to kind of avoid this pain. So how do we test this hypothesis? Maybe this is wrong, maybe this is not the case. It's difficult to test this hypothesis. You can't just go around asking people, hey, do you have kids, do you have kids, do you have kids? It's, it's, not, it's not nice, people will, will bounce off the website all the time. So machine learning to rescue, we can actually build a model that guesses whether the user is actually forgetting about adding information about the kids or not. And the input data is, is data like the location of the user, the destination where they're going, how long are they staying, uh, how much in advance they're booking. Families tend to book much more in advance than, than non-families and so on. So by looking at this kind of even filters they use or, or mouse movement sometimes, looking at these patterns, we can guess whether the user is actually forgetting about the kids or not. And this machine learning model helps us to test the hypothesis, and we design an experiment where the treatment is simply to say, if the machine learning model says uh, that the, this user is actually traveling with kids, but he or she forgot about entering the information about the kids, we can remind them. And here you can see three screenshots uh, from different platforms, like uh, mobile, tablet, and, and, and desktop. And we tried this experiment in all these platforms. And, and of course, uh, it was successful, otherwise I wouldn't tell in, be telling this story here. Uh, so essentially, indeed, uh, families forget about their kids, and, and, and then they get bad recommendations, and then they book less. But with the machine learning model, we managed to test the hypothesis and to improve the experience for families uh, quite a lot. So that's just an, ex an example of how we use this process and what is the, the relationship with machine learning models. And because this process of continuous learning runs all across the organization, that gives huge demand for machine learning models. Everybody is trying to learn something about the users at some point. They say, oh, how do we test this? Ah, I know, machine learning. Then again, how do we test this? I don't know, well, machine learning. So that produces a huge demand for machine learning models. So what I want to talk about today is how do we support this demand? How do we make sure that we can actually build machine learning models for all these people trying to understand and learn from the customers and, 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 and users and, and improve their own systems? And one thing we did uh, is we created the uh, RS, uh, which is a central repository for machine learning uh, models. Uh, RS stands for many things, uh, real stuff, random stuff, uh, recommender system, uh, rocket science, uh, you know, all kind of things. So we don't say what it means, we just say it's RS. So this is our central machine learning um, uh, models repository, and it essentially allows us to do four, four main things. 
The first one and the most important probably is that it allows you to deploy machine learning models. Uh, so if you are a model builder, there are scientists or even a developer, you know how to build a model, you have a model, and I'm going to talk about how we build the model, but once the model is built, how do you make it available for users? How do you make it available for teams to actually test a hypothesis? Um, so our REST takes care of that. The second thing it allows us to do is if you're not a machine learning expert and you want to test a hypothesis in machine learning, well, you can go to this platform and actually browse models that are already existing there, and maybe you can, you can reuse one that was already built and maybe proven that it works, and you can maybe uh, save the cost of actually building a new model and reuse the one that already exists. And you can actually go to the, it's, it's a nice website, you can go and actually use the machine learning model yourself as, as a product owner or, or, or as a UX expert to actually get a sense of what the model does and whether it makes sense for, for your product or not. And of course, you can consume machine learning models. This mainly interacts with developers because they have to integrate the machine learning model or the predictions of the machine learning model in some other system. Machine learning doesn't work on its own ever. It's always integrated in some other system. So our REST is scared of giving a standard API where, where developers can, can consume or, or invoke and, and use the predictions for whatever they want. And finally, and no less important, is, is our REST is pretty pretty important at, at monitoring the machine learning model to make sure it, the model is healthy enough, it's useful, and maybe it helps you to tell whether we need to retrain or not and stuff like that. This is mainly for, for developers and scientists, but sometimes also for, for non-technical people, they can, they can tell whether the machine learning model is, is behaving properly or not, and that's quite, quite useful for everyone. So that was a bit of a long introduction. I would like to introduce two challenges that we found by building RS, by developing RS in the course of about two years. And uh, the first challenge comes from uh, a value that we have in Booking.com, which is the idea that diversity gives us strength. Um, and this sounds a little bit corny, I know, but it's super, super, uh, we take it very seriously in Booking. If you enter the Booking.com office, you will see the diversity right away. We have people from everywhere. We have people from, from uh, all kind of uh, countries, continents, uh, genders, and I don't even mean two genders. So the, the, the level of diversity in Booking.com is just mind-blowing. And, and we really, really believe that this is good for us because we can learn from each other, because we, it makes us better. I think if someone can understand this as machine learning people, if you uh, introduce variance in your model, your model will do better. So this is exactly what we do at Booking.com. And that does not escape technology. Um, uh, I picked three dimensions in which technology uh, introduces this idea of diversity. One is the programming language. We have people programming in Python, in Java, in R, in C, in Lua, in D, the new kids, D. Do you, have you ever heard of D language? Wow, OK, too many millennials. Anyway, second dimension is uh, libraries. I wonder if you got the Home Alone movie uh, reference then. Um, the, the libraries, of course. Ten, what, what, what is the best machine learning library? Is it TensorFlow? Is it, is it MXNet? Is it PyTorch? Is it H2O? I, does anybody recognize the pink rabbit? No? I knew. That's why I left the, the, the name there. This is a kind of a hidden gem of machine learning. It's called Vopal Wabi. It's by far my, my favorite machine learning library. Nobody knows it. Check it out. You know the, na the name now. And, um, and of course, backgrounds. This is super interesting, actually. We have physicists. We have uh, biologists. We have chemists. We have statisticians, mathematicians, econometricians, nothings, people without any degree at all. And we, we want to make sure, yeah, skaters, actually. We have one rocket scientist, literally a rocket scientist we have. Um, so how do we make sure we allow all these people to actually deploy their models? How do we make sure they can actually build the model the way they want in PyTorch with Lua being a physicist? How do we make sure they can all uh, be happy with our platform? Um, it's not easy, of course, and you, you, you will never get to 100% um, coverage of all the possible options, uh, but just having the idea already improves a lot uh, the, the environment. So. Let me show one, uh, one thing we did in order to, to achieve this. And it, it's a kind of an engineering principle, and it says that the, the coupling training code from prediction code is a good thing. And it sounds a bit counterintuitive, because usually you would like to have exactly the same code that runs in training time to run at prediction time, because that gives us a lot of consistency. But this coupling of training and prediction is actually bad for diversity. And we decided to deal with consistency issues rather than limiting people in how to build models. So we decided to introduce this idea of completely coupling training code from prediction code. So how do you do that? Well, there are many ways, and we implemented quite a few of them. Let me run through a, 
some examples. The first one is super simple, super straightforward, and I recommend everybody to do this, and probably a lot of you are doing this, which is just a lookup table. So how do you productionize a model? You just put it in a lookup table. What's a lookup table? It's just a big table that maps inputs to predictions. And why is this good? Well, at prediction time, it's amazingly fast, it's amazingly scalable, it's reliable. All you need to do is just take the input vector, look it up in the table, you have the prediction, you send it over to the consumer of the model, and that's it. Um, the nice thing about lookup tables is not only the fact that they are reliable, fast, and scalable, but also the fact that at prediction time, it doesn't matter how you train the model. You can use TensorFlow, you can use PyTorch, you can use Lua, you can be a physicist, you can be a nothing, and you can still put it in production, no problem. So what we did in RS is essentially gave, built a whole layer of management of look, these lookup tables to make sure they are uh, easy to use. But of course, this introduced some limitations because lookup tables can only work on a discrete space, so that means your feature space can only be discrete. You cannot use uh, continuous features. Um, also, it is a problem if your feature space, even if it's discrete, is too big, then the number of rows on the, on the lookup table will be too, too big. And that's actually not a problem in production because we use key value stores like Cassandra, for example, and it scales very, very well in the number of rows, so it's pretty much constant in latency uh, with respect to the number of rows, so that's not a problem, but the real problem is that you need to produce all these predictions every day or every hour, and if your feature space is too big, then maybe you don't make it in time, and that's a bit of an issue. So we, we kind of cope with this with, with several tricks, like for example, you, you are entitled to uh, update only the rows that change if you have a new model and stuff like that, and that kind of helps a lot. But that doesn't, you know, really solve the limitation. So that imposes or, or presents a trade-off to the author of the model, and the trade-off means that, okay, you get training flexibility because you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can do model complexity because you can use a linear model or a deep neural network or a random forest or a transformer with an LSTM on top and whatnot, uh, but you don't get to have as big feature comp space complexity as you would like to, and you don't get to use uh, linear uh, continuous features. So that's the price you pay for the flexibility you get. So this is one example that shows how decoupling uh, predictions from training code um, helps us to productionize many, many, many different ways of building models, uh, and also shows us an example of how when we do this, we present a trade-off to the, to the author of the model, but this trade-off is principle. There is a way to, to actually figure it out. Second example, it's the idea of generalized linear model. Um, this is the, well, not the only formula, but one of the formulas that we show. Essentially, here you want to predict something about uh, a user, maybe, and it's represented by feature vector x, and what we do simply, we take a transformation of the feature vector, t, and then we just apply an inner product with parameters w, and then we just take a link function f that turns the whole thing into scalar. So essentially, this is a generalized linear model. And as you can imagine, this is fairly easy to implement in, at prediction time. You just need to take the transformation of the features, take the inner product, apply the link function, and you're done. The magic actually happens at learning time. So we coded this, of course, because it's easy. And we can do it in a very reliable, very fast, very low latency, how throughput uh, fashion, which is exactly what we need in a company like Booking.com. And the magic happens that if you think about it for a second, depending on how you learn W and how you choose T and F, you can actually implement many, many different models. You can do naive base, you can do logistic regression, you can do linear SVM, you can do Poisson, neck binomial, beta, or quantile regression. Uh, depending how you choose T, you can actually introduce nonlinearities by bucketing your continuous features, so you can substitute, for example, an ID with an embedding that you learn using word to vec but at prediction time you don't, at prediction time you really don't care. You can use interaction to introduce uh, polynomial features, and, and then you introduce way more nonlinearities. And again, depending on how you choose F, you get different semantics of the output. It could be a continuous regression if you use F as an identity function. Um, it could be, uh, if you use sigmoid as an output, it can, it can be a probabilistic classifier because it will compress the numbers within C01. And if you take, for example, an exponential link function, it can be a discrete regression because what you could get, get bad is kind of a rate of events. And again, this is another example in which uh, by decoupling the way you train and the way you, you, you predict, you manage to cover way many uh, different type of, of ways of doing machine learning. Um, in, the, in this case, the only restriction is that you might, you need to be able to represent your model as uh, transformations, parameters for the transformer feature space, 
space and the link function. If you can represent your model like that, it doesn't matter how you built it, you will be able to put it in production in a fast, reliable, and scalable way. And just a bit more, you can actually rank things. You can take a, fe a feature vector of a user, for example, X again, but this time you want to rank a list of items. For example, it could be hotels, it could be destinations, it could be filters, anything that you want to rank. It could be classes, for example. And what you want to do is simply sort by the inner product of a parameter vector associated to each item and a transformation that happens to each feature vector for each item. And we see exactly the same pattern again. Depending on how you learn WBU, you recover different families of models. For example, if you use softmax or one versus all and your, your item space is small, this is, looks like a multi-class classification. And at prediction time, you don't really even need to use softmax because it's monotonously increasing, so all you need to do is the inner product. That's all you care about. Uh, if you use constitutive classification to learn the model, then you are actually allowing multi-labels. So each object can have many labels, not only one. And you can do this easily at prediction time. No, you don't need to change anything. Now you can go for the fancy stuff. You can use word 2 vec GLOF, random projections, and you can learn embeddings. And in this case, WView will be an embedding for each item, for example, and the transformation will just look up an embedding for each uh, other item, and then if you take the inner product, you are doing exactly cosine or Euclidean KNN, depending on how you normalize your, your vectors. And finally, if you learn WV as a matrix factorization, uh, then WV can be the latent space or the latent vector for each user, and the transformation can be the latent vectors for, for the item, and then you are doing, making an inner product between a user vector and an item vector, and that's exactly a matrix factorization uh, model and you're uh, essentially building a recommender system to recommend items to, to users. So this is, again, a way to decouple predictions from training. It doesn't matter how you train, as long as you can represent your, your model by a transformation and a set of parameters for each item, you can put it in production in a reliable, scalable, and fast uh, uh, fashion. But of course, you pay a cost. We flip a little bit compared to, to lookup tables. Uh, in this case, you still have quite a bit of training flexibility. You can use whatever language, you can use whatever um, uh, library or framework you like. Uh, you can have quite a huge feature space complexity. It doesn't matter how many features you, you have. This case very well the number of features. Uh, and you can have, of course, continuous features and all kind of features you want, not like uh, lookup tables. Uh, but the cost you pay in model complexity. Why? Because you can't represent every model with this uh, approach, right? For example, if you want to uh, introduce a decision tree, you cannot do it with this, right? Because it's, it's not representable as a linear uh, combination of features. Uh, but again, because of this principle of decoupling prediction from training, we can present the user a trade-off and tell, tell him, look, if you do want to do a decision tree, maybe you want to use a lookup table. If you want to use uh, uh, huge ma many uh, features, then maybe you want to use a linear model, and so on. Um, of course, at some point you could ask, but what if I do want to introduce a random forest, and I don't want to use a lookup table because uh, you know it's too too much work to actually produce the, the recommendations, uh, the, the predictions every day. So what we did is we hide we behind the deployment layer other ways of making predictions. For example, if you want to use tree-based models, uh, you can deploy an H2O model. Because uh, H2O is pretty good at, at, at learning tree-based models, and, and there is pretty fast at prediction time, so we decided that we can put this behind RS. So if you want to train trees, you can do with H2O, throw, throw the, the model in RS, and it will pick it up and it will work. How about neural nodes? How do we deploy neural nodes? Well, you can do it with TensorFlow. How about uh, something weird, like, uh, I don't know, some, some other new model that you just make up? Well, you can always deploy a script, a Python script, that you, you do whatever you want. And, and you can see in this case, the trade-off is again there, because, okay, uh, you can do trees if you want, but you can only do trees with H2O. If you want to do trees with LightGBM, for example, which is pre or XGBoost, that's not possible today. If you want to do neural networks, you can do it with TensorFlow only. You want to do it with uh, PyTorch, you cannot do it today or you have to do it in Python with a scripted model. So again, the author of the model is exposed to a trade-off and they have to make these trade-offs in a principal way. So again, we flip the third variable here, and here we have huge model complexity, uh, complete uh, feature space complexity, but you pay the cost of training flexibility because you can only, sorry, you can only get to train your models using these uh, libraries or, or languages. 
Um, so that's a bit the trick that we did, and it was very, very helpful to, to uh, cope with this diversity that we have in Booking.com, and now everybody pretty much can, can, can deploy the models they want. And everybody will see a new tool picking up. For example, now we see XGBoost being very much used. Then the team behind RS is aware of this, and they probably go and try to make sure that people building models with XGBoost, they can somehow implement it. And if it gets super popular, at some point maybe we support native XGBoost if we believe it's fast enough, it's reliable, it's production ready. Uh, today, we don't think that's the case. It's quite unstable, actually. Um, at least for, for, for the load that we get in Booking.com. Remember, this is uh, 1.5 tra transactions per day. You can imagine how many requests per second we get and how many predictions. This is, I don't want to lie, but I think it's about 75,000 predictions per second. So you, you, you need to be very careful what kind of things you put be behind the user in, in that case. Good. I hope that makes sense. That was the first challenge. This is how we address it. Let's move on to the second challenge before I run, run out of time. It's monitoring. Um, I, when I introduce RS, I, one of the last block is uh, with, it allows you to do monitoring. And monitoring is quite difficult, actually, in the context of, of uh, at least Booking.com, I guess many e-commerce also. And we, I highlight three problems here. One is the missing information. And that's exactly the idea that some labels are not available. So in the ideal world, in the Kegel world, uh, you just run your model and you get precision recall, whatever accuracy metric you want, NDCG, mean reciprocal rate reciprocal rank, but because you have the labels, because you have ground truth. But when you deploy a model in production, that's not true. For example, in the family uh, traveler problem, uh, we only get to know whether the, act, the user is actually traveling with kids if the user books. For users that don't book, we don't know whether the model was right or wrong. We don't have a label. And unfortunately, most people don't book in Booking.com. You can imagine we don't have more than 50% conversion. So that means we only get to see the labels for a small uh, sample of, of, of users and for, of, of predictions, I mean. And for the other predictions, we don't know the label, so we cannot really tell how well the model is doing. So one could say, okay, but we, you can still monitor precision recall, for example, in, in this uh, subsample of, of predictions for which you do have the label. Well, not so fast because um, we make the prediction, for example, in the family traveler problem in search results page, right? As soon as you search, we try to predict whether you're traveling with kids, and we show the message if, you, if the model says yes. Uh, but it may take time, like days, until you actually book. So the prediction is already made, but we only get the label weeks later. And that's sometimes too late to actually spot a problem in the model. So the fact that the labels that we do get get uh, delayed is, is a deal breaker, actually, for, for label-based uh, monitoring. And finally, and maybe a bit more obvious, is the fact that the predictions, sorry, the feature space and the label distribution change in time. And that makes it really, really hard to, to predict because, again, this combined with delayed information makes the whole thing quite, quite, quite difficult. So how do we, how did we address this, this problem? Well, we came up with this idea that we call respond distribution analysis. And it's quite a simple but, but powerful idea. So what we do is, is uh, in, this, in this chart you can see on the x-axis, uh, the, the prediction of the model. So in this case, it's a logistic regression, so the output goes from 0 to 1. And in the y-axis, you can see how often each prediction was made. It's a history of how often each output was present in the, in the system. And in orange, you can see the, the cumulative distribution function, so it goes all the way to 1, always increasing. And uh, in blue, in the middle, you can see um, a recommended threshold, which is a point where you could use, uh, where you can choose a threshold with some warranties about how the model will behave. So how do we use this, 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 uh, this is a simple chart, I hope it makes sense for everyone. It's just a histogram of the output of the model. And how is it useful to tell whether the model is working well or not? Well, in order to see that, you need to think, what would a perfect model look like? Imagine you have a model that is always correct. What it will look like? Well, essentially, it will be just two peaks, right? One at one and one at zero. Because if the model is always right, there's no point for the model to output anything between 0 and 1. It will just output the correct label, positive or, or 1, and negative 0. And the, the height of the peaks would be exactly the proportions of, of, of the classes in, in the problem, right? In this case, it's, of course, an ideal uh, uh, model. I never saw this in my life. This I just hard-coded, and I put 50-50 just, just because. But it could be any height. But the point that you see perfect peaks at zero and at one because the model, we call this an omniscient model because it's not only correct, but it's also uh, absolutely confident about being correct. So 
it doesn't make sense to output anything between 0 and 1 but 0 and 1. Now, again, this is an ideal model. It doesn't really exist, but it gives you um, a hint of what to expect from a model that is not perfect but good. If a model is good but not perfect, you should see something very similar to this with noise. So you should see some sort of mixture of two beta distributions, one in the uh, higher end, close to one, uh, with the mean close to one, and the other beta with the mean close to zero, and in a mixture. So it should look like kind of a, like a parabola. Um, so let's look at some patterns that we found in Booking.com to be very clear about how we use this. This is what we call a confused model. So you can see here that this model is failing completely discriminating two classes. Right? Because it, most of the time it outputs a probability that is what? 0 0.44, right? So uh, that doesn't really help you to tell whether the, the item is positive or negative. And the main characteristics of a confused model are that it's a single mode, um, it's central mode, it's always kind of in the middle, and there's no stable point. That means that there's no place in the, in the hill where you drop a ball and the ball stays. Whatever you drop it, it will just go away, right? And we'll see in a second why that's important. And I hope it makes sense to everybody that this model fails completely at discriminating uh, positive and negative classes in the population. And the main reason for this is usually high base error. And that means that uh, for the features you're using, the label all you can learn is a label distribution. And the label distribution is quite symmetric. And that means your, your features are not being helpful at all, are not discriminative, and then your model is failing. And maybe in, in, in training time, your model was good enough, but when you put it in production, actually, you see this and then you know that something went wrong. Um, so essentially, what this is pointing out is that you should add more features or change the, the, the features or maybe even add more complexity to your model to make sure you find a discriminative uh, power in your, in your model. But for sure, you know this model cannot be good. Uh, a second pattern we see is what we call an overconfident model. So this is a bit of a better model than before because you can already see two modes, one a small one at 0 to 12 and the other one at 1. And you can see some, something similar to stable point, which is the, the, the blue bar in the middle. And the idea here is that you have extreme mode. It could be close to 1 or close to 0, but it's extreme. And it's the single one, it's the only mode, and it's very high frequency. And this is one that, the one that we see the most, actually. So what's wrong with this model? So usually what we see is the cold star problem. The cost of problem is you, you have new items all the time, like new hotels, new users, right? So imagine you're training a model with some hotels, and there is one hotel that is not very popular in the training set. So maybe your logistic regression may assign a big weight to this uh, hotel. But then in training time, because it's not very frequent, you won't see this as a problem at all. But then when you put it in production, suddenly the hotel becomes very popular because for whatever reason, the owner decided to put the prices very low and then now the hotel is super popular. Everybody's looking at this hotel, it goes up in the ranking, everybody gets to see the hotel and now your model is predicting a lot, uh, a feature vector that has a very high weight. And because it's a logistic regression, the inner product blows up and then the signal function goes to one. And then you see that immediately in the, in the response distribution chart and, and, and you, you can see that, you know, this is not good. You, you never want a, a, a classifier to be that confident. You always want a classifier to be conservative to some extent to make sure that uh, there is some room for, for mistakes. So that's one problem, cold start. The second problem is outliers. This is quite, quite common, actually. Maybe for some reason, some user wants to stay, to stay in a hotel for 2,000 days. Uh, so of course, it's not very common. And then if for whatever reason, uh, for example, bots attacks, this is a problem. And you can see immediately how the, the logistic regression blows up because 2000 is something that you're not used to see in the training set. And the, actually the most common one is integration issues. And I remember the story where we were building this model or deploying this model that uses price as, um, as a feature. And the model was trained with price in euros. But when we put it in production, the developer decided to put in the feature vector the price in the local uh, currency. And in countries where the euro is super expensive, what happens is that when you take the, say, 10,000 uh, Bolivian pesos, uh, and you multiply that by, into a weight that is learned for, for euros, then again, the inner product blows up, and the logistic regression, the sigma goes to one, and, and you get to see it in this, in this, in this peak. 
Um, so in this, this case, I think it's pretty clear. It helps, it, in this case, it helps us a lot to, to find out what's wrong. And the point is, in, in our platform, you can actually click on these bars and see which axis, which feature vectors are actually producing those predictions. And it helps us a lot to debug what's going on. Um, and that's very, very useful to, to find problems early enough. And then another pattern, this is what we call a maybe good model. Now we are in a, in a, a bit more happy, uh, I would say. Uh, so essentially it's a model that, that is probably good. Uh, that's what we say, maybe good model. But that, let's look at the characteristics. First of all, it's bimodal, so there are two, two modes. You, you can think of this as, as two beta distributions mixed up. Uh, it's quite smooth, so it doesn't have huge jumps from, from one prediction to another. That means probably that model is properly regularized. Um, it has wide support, which means that pretty much every probability is, is present in the, in, the, in, the, in the output of the model. You can see that 0 and 1 are pretty much never there, which is also good, because that means the model is never overconfident about its predictions. And there's one single stable point, which is the blue, the blue bar. Uh, that means if you put a ball there and you move it a little bit, it will go back there. And that's a pretty good way to choose a, a threshold. Um, now, this is just a maybe good model. And this is a super important point for this tool. And uh, this chart in particular is telling us there's nothing wrong with this model. But that doesn't mean the model is good. This model could be completely wrong, could be completely flipping the labels, and, and you, it's completely, uh, error rate is 100%. Um, but the point is that this tool, response distribution analysis, helps us to spot problems. It, it will never tell you that the model is good, but it can help you to tell that the model is bad. So that's a, that's a super important point. And here's the same model, uh, but a few days later. Uh, so you can see how it changed quite a bit. Um, it got a bit more uh, conservative. Uh, there is a new, uh, probably a new beta in the middle, close to the threshold. That probably means there is a new concept coming up, may, may, maybe a new, a new class that we need to take care of. Um, also, the, the heights of the modes uh, change. So that means probably the class distribution is changing. Uh, so this is very useful to check that the, the, the um, domain shift or, or, or non-stationarity is kicking in. So it, it helps you to tell whether you need to retrain your model, for example, or, or not. It, it points out that uh, something is changing in, in the model. And a bit uh, funny one, this is uh, too good to be true. It's a perfect uh, bimodal, non-aggressive non at all, super conservative, super smooth. We saw this in April 1st. I don't know if that's a thing here in Ukraine. Someone was making a joke on us. But actually, we see this uh, when there is leakage. When, the, when your label leaks into your features, I think uh, there was a talk yesterday from Dara Robot about it. So this tool is super helpful to, to detect leakage. Uh, because if your leakage is not absolute, that means uh, that the label leaks into some features in particular, not in all, sorry, in to some examples in particular, you won't see AUC 099 in your training set you will see something reasonable. But then when you put it in production, you will see an amazing response distribution chart because the model is very good at, 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 at discriminating wrongly. So when you, see, when you see something like this, this is a huge red flag, actually. You should never see something like this. And finally, robots travel for leisure. This is a, this is a model that we built to detect whether a user is traveling for leisure or business. The positive class is a business traveler. And it looks like we had this, uh, well, we know we had this robot attack. Uh, where they were sending always the same values. And then the model was, uh, of course, making always the same predictions for the same values. And uh, yeah, they were hitting us so hard that you see this huge peak uh, at uh, 0 0.29 or something. Um, so it was very easy to spot that there was a bot attack in our system. So if you're building scrapers or, or crawlers or bots, make sure you send different values to, to so you introduce some variance so, so we, 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 can, we won't be able to take it, to pick it up with this tool. So going back to the issues, missing information, delayed information, and changing information, the way it response distribution analysis addresses these issues is quite um, strong. Uh, missing information is, addre is addressed by the fact that the response distribution analysis can be built based on all the examples, not only the ones you only have labels. Uh, that's key. The second thing, delayed information, is that you, can, you don't care, because you can build a distribution as, as soon as your model starts making prediction. So you don't need to wait for any labels or anything like that. And finally, you will have to take my word for this one. This response distribution chart is super sensitive to changes in this feature space distribution, label distribution, which again is super useful to spot uh, problems maybe in the integration, 
maybe uh, mobile for some reason stops making invocations to, to the model, and you can pick it up immediately by looking at the response distribution chart because it will change. And so that's how uh, we address this. Of course, there are quite a few limitations. Uh, first of all, it's a heuristic. It's the most important thing. Uh, to wrap up, two seconds to finish. Um, how do the machine learning models running live in Booking.com? Our approach, how do we do it? Well, we apply continuous learning. We uh, build a centralized machine learning repository to make sure everybody can, can build it. We offer principal trade-offs to people to make sure they can deploy the models. It doesn't matter how you train them and what language or framework they use. And we make sure we keep uh, our models healthy by applying heuristics, which are way uh, uh, weaker, but they are uh, fast to tell us about problems and, 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 and issues in our models. And that's the Booking.com approach. That's all I got, and I'm happy to take questions. Easy ones. Well, Lucas, thank you for a very interesting speech. Uh, questions? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question. Uh, we have some um, methods of uh, testing your machine learning models. Uh, I mean, uh, it's pretty simple to write, for example, a unit test to test some uh, programming model, right? Uh, but uh, it's not that really easy to write this same unit test for a machine learning model. So how do you test your models and uh, uh, how do you ensure that they're good and uh, reliable? Thank you. Um, so you mean when you train the model, how do you make sure it works? Uh, I mean like after you train the model, you really, uh, and uh, even if you like, keep training them like, uh, continuously, uh, you really want to be sure that they ah, yeah. uh, keep uh, everything yeah. good. Uh, yeah, we're running experiments. We, we, we do A-B test. When you have a new model, you, you compare it to the old model, and you look at some specific KPIs, and we make sure they are OK. OK, thank you. Sure. Thank you for your talk. Uh, quick question. Uh, you use the same approach. You showed the example with model monitoring uh, based on uh, classification. Yeah. So you follow the same approach for uh, regression, right? No. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work for regression because it's hard to say what to expect. For regression, you should know the actual distribution, right? That, that's the whole point. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you said if you're a talk, it was really interesting and insightful. But uh, my question is: your RS uh, stuff is more like framework for uh, building models when every model should. Uh, uh, implement some methods because it's more like a uh, server for deploying your models, which <coughs> freeform. No, it's a, it's a, it's infrastructure. It's a server. It's not a framework. Uh, and one of our principles is actually you don't push code ever to a REST. You only push data. So uh, when you train a model, you need to represent your model in in some sort of uh, format that represents data. It's never code, um, and you you can push it uh, to a REST because we cannot really. You know, you have 200 data scientists in Booking.com, you, you cannot take calls from every parent to put it in production, just like that. So that's why we need to make a data, a data uh, interface. So it's, it's a service running with, with the, some sort of HTTP API where you can send a file, and the file can be a CSV for, for linear models, it, and it, it can be some sort of uh, serialization like PPML and stuff like that, uh, but that's about it. Uh, we have for Python scripts a completely different infrastructure that is hidden behind uh, the API, uh, but we try to avoid that. We actually have a, we try to make sure that we have the least number of models running as a Python script, because that's code that we don't uh, uh, own, but is owned by data scientists, and we don't want it. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting. First of all, let me tell you that I'm a very happy user of uh, Booking.com for already so many years. You're welcome. It's such an amazing solution. Thank you so much for doing this. You're happy to pay my salary. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is, uh, since I signed with the Facebook uh, ID, actually I kind of hope that you already know uh, everything about the level of comfort that I prefer mm. and different kinds of interiors and blah, 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 so that you actually can suggest the best 
solution, the best hotel for me in this or that geographical location. Is it actually happening and I, doesn't, I, don't, I don't notice this or it's something that I can hope to have in the future as a user? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. It's a difficult one. I have to say, like, we try as much as we can. Maybe we're failing, right? But uh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. This uh, white web lead uh, framework, I haven't heard about it, my bad. Uh, for what purposes do you use it? For mobile Wabbit? Yeah. Oh, that's a training. It's, it's, a, it's a stochastic rendition and uh, implementation. It's a very old. It's from, from a guy called John Ramford. He's kind of a hidden genius of machine learning. He worked in Yahoo, well, in Microsoft. And he and others built this library. It's in GitHub, it's open source. Uh, it's, it's very weird, it, it's, it's quite awkward to use because it's just a common line tool, but it runs out of core. It can scale to 100, machine, 100 million rows easily, like in minutes, and it implements state of the art uh, linear uh, models. Thank you. Take a look. Yeah. <coughs> the last one. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> And I have a question actually, uh, how to make sure that you don't make too many predictions for a user? So basically how you reduce the false positive rate. So you know what I mean. So basically you say that we don't want to make too many predictions because it can be, I mean, too annoying for a user, right? Oh yeah. So we want to reduce this rate, kind of reduce the number of predictions but make them more relevant, right? Yes. The correct one. How do you deal with this problem? Yes, we, we don't have any, any systematic uh, method to do that. It's, it's quite difficult, actually. <coughs> we rely heavily on experimentation. I mean, if you pull out your phone now, and two of you or three of you look exactly for the same destination, exactly the same, in Booking.com you will get the completely different experiences because you are in two different experiments. We have thousands of experiments running every day, and we rely mainly on, on that approach to, to, to test what actually works and what's not. And, 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 um, one, one thing I can comment is that uh, we have a method to, to make sure latency is unchecked. So when you build a model that is actually better than, than the base model, but introduces higher latency, then if you look at the KPIs, it will be worse because the latency is it, it, tough, but it, it's higher. But we can actually disentangle the effect coming from the latency and the effect coming from the improvement of the model. And then that tells us whether we should keep on working on improving the latency of that particular model or throw it away. Um, you can read about it in our blog. It's uh, yeah, this one, booking.ai, um, and uh, yeah, maybe that, that helps to, to understand how how we do that. But in general, we don't have any systematic way to actually keep everything uh, running well. We rely on experimentation. Stormer for plus for Lucas. Thanks a lot. <laughs>